All right, we're going to launch Photoshop. If you haven't already, sign into your Creative Cloud license. All right. So we'll create a new file in Photoshop. Um, and again, I'm recording this also. Um, and we'll use the film and video presets. So we'll just start with creating a Photoshop file that's going to be exactly the size we need for class. So we'll use this preset called HDTV 1080p. Make sure it's 1920 by 1080 pixels at 72 ppi, which means 72 uh, points per inch. That refers to the resolution. So we can name this document Rotoscope, and then click Create. What Photoshop is good for is the brushes. It's the digital art tools. It's the digital painting tools. Um, in programs like Toonbeam Harmony, you don't really have that same level of like brush textures and all of that. So if you're f familiar with working in Procreate, for example, on your iPad, um, Photoshop is just like way more powerful than Procreate. But it's going to be a similar experience where you've got all these amazing brushes, settings, um, presets to play with. Um, so the timeline in Photoshop will let you create animations in a very like visually rich style. Um, and so that is really the advantage um, of <laughs> of dealing with the limitations of Photoshop timeline for animation. You can achieve some really beautiful digitally um, aesthetic looks. You have a layers panel and you've got some tools on your left side. So again, go up to window and just set your workspace to um, essentials default. <coughs> that way we're looking at all the same panels. So Photoshop is based on layers. And as animators, layers are important to us because that means we can separate things and animate them and treat them differently. Um, also, the thing to note is that because um, Photoshop and After Effects and even Premiere Pro are all made by Adobe, that means there's more and more seamless integration moving your files from one program to the next. So in Photoshop, However you set up your layers, um, if you import it properly into After Effects, you get that exact same setup and organization. So that'll be really good to know for a future reference. So for now, um, look at your layers panel. Your background is always going to be the default layer. It's always going to be locked by default. So just double click that and it will unlock it um, and then you can change it. Now, I don't recommend drawing on this because it is a white sheet of paper. If you draw on it, then your line will always be stuck to the background color. And as animators, the more we can keep things separate, the more control we can have later on. So I always end up just naming this um, BG for background. It just gives me a color block to look at and to draw on top of. Um, if you come do down to the bottom of the layers panel, you get this plus sign that will easily add a new layer. Um, and so you can directly draw um, or paint on these layers. Anywhere you see a checkerboard pattern means that it's transparent. So if I come over and I just grab a brush tool, um, or you can hit B for brush, um, you can pick your color by just clicking on one of these swatches here over on the left. Um, and you can begin to draw. And this should be a fairly intuitive experience, uh, especially if you're familiar working in Procreate. Um, at the top, you have this menu bar of all these different properties and settings um, and options. So whenever you choose a tool from the left, always look at the top to see what um, alterations you can make to those tools. So your pencil tool, your brush tool, um, the mixer brush tool, those are all tucked inside the same icon, um, which looks like this pencil, or it'll look like whatever tool you've selected. Um, memorizing the shortcuts is also going to be very helpful for you. 
Um, but if you select a brush tool, go up to the top, you'll see you have choices for different um, brush textures. Um, you can even save your own um, brush settings and reuse it again. Um, so you can choose that um, and explore a little bit there. Um, and then you can make multiple layers. So I'll draw some green elements on a second layer on top. And if you take the selection tool, which looks like this uh, crosshairs tool at the very top, it's called the move tool. If I'm selected on one of my layers, and I just click and drag, then you can begin to see, oh wow, I have control over those paint strokes I just made, and I can begin to reposition them, or you know, you can kind of see where this is, where this is going. Um, always be organized, always name your layers, please. You will thank yourself later. Uh, so I'm going to name my green layer, let's say these are abstract blades of grass, and my brown layer, I'm just going to say it's these like aspects of dirt. Um, and so again, the more you keep things separated, the more control you have later on, especially in a program like After Effects, to animate it separately or to even add special effects only isolated to those layers. So these are still image layers. Um, I just want to quickly point out the mixer brush tool because this is one of the unique features of Photoshop. The mixer brush tool is tucked inside the pencil or the brush tool. Um, if you click and hold, you'll see that menu. Um, and what it does is it mimics the properties of wet paint. So it, it allows you to kind of do this live mixing of colors right within Photoshop. Um, so you can have it pick up new colors. Um, so you see here, I can switch my swatches. Let me change this to red. And with the mixer brush, I can blend red with the green and create you know, the effect of like as if I was painting with wet red and wet green paint. So you might want to try this with your rotoscope assignment, right? And just take advantage of some of these really great digital painting tools and effects that Photoshop has to offer. Um, okay, so there's two kinds of layers in Photoshop, right? There's this layer, it's a still image, it's a single image. And then we're going to have video layers. So to explore the video layers, um, let's first save our Photoshop document. So the shortcut is Control S. Um, and you want to make sure that it is saved on your computer. So um, Creative Cloud does have a cloud library that's available to you within your account. But Post Production Center upstairs doesn't recommend using it. It's just a little clunky. So we recommend students just always work off of your hard drive or uh, the animation server. So Control S to save on your computer. <laughs> and then um, it's really trying to convince you to use Creative Cloud uh, storage. <laughs> so you can, you can say, yeah, don't show again, and then just save on your own computer. Um, and then you can um, make sure you're saving it to either your hard drive or Now, you'll get a choice as to the type of file to save it as, and we are going to want to save it as a Photoshop file. So Photoshop files are called .psd, um, and what that means is that Photoshop creates this package that it knows how to read, and .psd files will preserve all of our layers separated. Um, if you save it as a JPEG, it's going to flatten all of your layers and you won't get access to them and you won't be able to control them individually. So PSD files allow you to save layers. So make sure you're saving that as a PSD and then we will press save. Save. 
All right, so I mentioned there's two kinds of layers. There's the regular uh, single image layer, and then there's the video layer. So let's go up to the Windows panel, and we are going to reveal the timeline panel. So come all the way down to where it says timeline. And then you'll see a new window pop up. Now, a helpful shortcut to memorize as soon as possible, especially when using Adobe software, is Control plus or minus on the top of your keyboard. That will quickly let you zoom in and out of your Canvas work area. Um, if you have a scrolling button on your mouse, you can also program that to either zoom in and out, or by default, it might just scroll up and down. So um, in and out is Control plus and minus. So now we can see all of the panels open. We have our timeline now, so let's click that button, Create Video Timeline. By default, Photoshop Timeline is set up in a way that we don't need for class, all right? So as soon as you create a video timeline, it's going to take all of your still image layers and then extrapolate them out to five seconds by default. Also, look at the bottom of the timeline it gives us um, a frame rate by default, 29.97 um, frames per second, right? So this is not what we need for class. In class, we're doing 24 frames per second, right? Um, and in fact, for this assignment, um, I might even recommend animating at 12 frames per second because you're going to be rotoscoping video footage. So I'll leave that up to you, but I will show you in 12 frames per second today. So there's a menu in the timeline panel on the upper right side, those series of lines. So we have to change our timeline frame rate. So you need to do this as soon as you create a timeline in Photoshop. Um, you want to do this before you start drawing any animation. If you change the frame rate after you've already started animate, it's like Photoshop doesn't know how to translate that. So things are going to look and act weird. And the reason is because you cannot uh, change the frame rate after you've started animating. So let's, um, I'm going to change it to 12 frames per second because I know I'm going to be doing some hand-drawn uh, rotoscoping. Um, so that means I'll just have to draw every frame. Um, and then later, when I export it for class, it's essentially going to put my drawn animation on twos, right? Because I'll hand it in at 24 frames per second, but I'll draw on ones. Um, so create that. Create your timeline. Set the frame rate. Um, and then now, let's also create some video layers. So you can go to the layer menu at the top. Come down to the middle where it says um, well, there's two options. You can create a new video layer from a f an existing file. So this is, where you, this is how you will import uh, the clip that you're tracing into Photoshop. Um, and then new blank video layer. This is what you will draw on. So for now, let's just create a new blank video layer. And you'll see that it showed up in your timeline, and it's blue whereas the other layers are purple, all right? So purple layers are still images, whereas blue layers are video layers. Um, so the minimum requirement of the rotoscope part of the assignment is that you rotoscope three seconds of animation. Uh, by default, the Photoshop timeline just cuts everything off at five seconds. So you can extend it or you can trim it down um, but just know that by default, Photoshop just makes it five seconds. Um, if you uh, hover at the end of your layer, you'll see that you get a little, um, a little arrow tool that lets you trim layers down. Um, and so I can actually trim my still layers so that they pop on and off. So now I've got my grass showing up, and then the dirt shows up separately. 
So if you work with still images in the, uh, if you work with still layers in the Photoshop timeline, it's going to feel a little bit like uh, how we did the flipbook. Um, every drawing, you know, has a time length on it, an exposure rate, and then you can adjust that after the fact, after you've drawn it. Um, and so you could conceivably animate um, on a series of these purple layers, trim them down to the exposure rate you want, and then just stack them, stack them, stack them in Photoshop. And so many, many animators uh, uh, do this in Photoshop timeline. Um, but the video layer in Photoshop, um, there, there's a purpose and there's an advantage to using that as well. So select your video layer, and I'm going to turn off my other purple layers for now. Um, draw, a quick little, draw a quick little ball on there, as if, as if we're animating a bantam ball, right? So just draw from the top here, and then if you advance to the next frame, you'll see my ball disappears. And that's because it's treating the video layer as like different individual frames all condensed into one video layer container. So we'll need onion skin to be able to see what we're actually doing here. So let's come back to the timeline panel menu and enable onion skins. And we can come back in there and you'll see that onion skin settings are a different menu option. And you can adjust how many frames before and after you're seeing based on your preference. Um, so sometimes I just like to set I just like to see three frames before uh, in my onion skin. So I'm going to change this onion skin count to three. And now you'll see that when I, let's see, I have to zoom in on my timeline. And when you're in the timeline panel, the left and right arrows lets you go frame by frame. In, oh in the timeline God. panel, okay. yeah, so oh enable the timeline shortcut keys, that'll save you a headache. So now with the onion skin on, I can see my previous frames and begin to animate straight ahead um, a ball here. And so this method of using the video layer is a pretty good and efficient one for rotoscoping, right? Because when you're rotoscoping, in general, you're tracing the frames sequentially. You're going straight ahead. Um, and so then you can just trace over your video reference with a fresh new video layer um, and start to see that play back. So with a combination of video layers and these still image layers, you can actually create a little scene just solely in Photoshop. Um, you can have background elements. Um, you can have rotoscoped elements. You can have drawn elements here. Um, what I'm going to recommend for your assignment this week is to use the Photoshop timeline for your rotoscoping. So you'll, you'll create a timeline, you'll change the frame rate, and then you'll come up to layer, um, video layers. You go to new video layer from file. This is how you can import your uh, movie clip that you're gonna be referencing. Um, I recommend that you trim your clip to you know, three seconds or five seconds before bringing it into Photoshop. Um, if you import like a, a minute long <laughs> clip, um, it's really gonna slow Photoshop down, unless you are intent on rotoscoping a minute <laughs> for your assignment this week. But so take your video clip ahead of time into Premiere, just trim it down to the moment that you wanna rotoscope, export that moment, and then just import that into uh, Photoshop. Um, but as long as your Photoshop timeline is the right frame rate, uh, that's what's most important. Okay, so notice that our rotoscope um, document is 1920 by 1080, right? 
Um, but we can actually create artwork that is bigger than 1920 by 1080 so that when we bring it into After Effects, we have more room to play with um, a high quality artwork image. Um, so what I'm gonna have you do this week is to rotoscope some animation, but also to have you create some background artwork in Photoshop. So you'll do that in a separate Photoshop document. So we can quickly set that up here. So let's go, make sure your rotoscope PSD is saved. And then we're gonna go to File, New. And then this time, we're gonna create a custom size. So we'll, we'll call this background art for our rotoscope scene. Let's see. Okay, we'll just start with the 1920 by 1080, and then you can come in and then type it in okay. yourself. Yeah. So, so we're gonna type in this. Um, so this will give us three fields to work with, and this is how we'll have to create it. Um, I didn't mention this before, but always just make sure that your uh, pixel aspect ratio is square pixels. So we'll create this. And so now you see we have the shape of a pan. So we'll create an artwork, and this could be, um, you know, a cityscape, or it could be a mountain landscape, or, you know, whatever you'd like. But now you've got this whole landscape, and you know you'll have enough to pan with later on. Um, I was talking about adding the 10% margin. So a quick way that you can do that is to go to image, go to canvas size, and here you can make adjustments after you've already created the Photoshop document. So we'll change this from pixels to percent, and we'll just increase it by 10 or, or even 5%. So we're gonna say 105%. And then hit OK. And then now you'll see, OK, I, this green color is just like the default background color. Um, that's because my layers were created at the first size. Um, but now I have this extra margin. Um, so I recommend doing that. Whenever you're creating background artwork, always give yourself a margin that's bigger than 1920 by 1080 because it's better to have that flexibility later on in After Effects. So then you would save this separately. Um, as part of the assignment, I'm requiring that your background art um, is big enough to have some kind of camera move, whether uh, a pan or whether uh, zooming in or out. Um, and you would calculate it the same way. Um, and also that you have at least three layers in your background. So foreground elements, background elements, um, clouds, for instance. Clouds should be on a separate layer from the mountains. You know, just keep everything separate. Uh, you should have at least three layers in your background art that you can later manipulate and animate in After Effects. So you'll save this as your background artwork. So we'll do save. And again, make sure it is a PSD file because we want to access all of those separate layers later on in After Effects. So I'm going to save this as a PSD. Um, and then that gets us ready for After Effects. So we had left off with creating a separate Photoshop document for background art. And we talked about how you have to kind of think in advance of what your shot is and what's happening in your shot so that you can create artwork that is going to be big enough to use. Um, and then for the assignment requirements, I'm requiring that you have at least three different layers going on in your background. Um, and again, um, you need to get into the habit of just clearly labeling um, all of your layers. So I'm going to quickly finish up this panning background art. So I'm gonna call this um, let's see, city, oops, here's my cityscape, and then I'm going to have a layer of clouds that's separate from the city, so I'll just finish drawing that. And then if you can, incorporate some foreground elements too. So I'll make a separate layer for foreground, and foreground means there's going to be objects that are closer to the camera, um, and that can give some 
interesting opportunities there. Um, and then what I'm going to do is select the three street lights that I drew and then with my move tool on the windows if you select some of the objects in your layers and then press down the alt button you can quickly duplicate those selections and this is a nice way to not have to redraw some things and then control D to so I can show you again I took the selection tool or the marquee tool and then I just selected around these pixels which is my street lights and then um, going back to the move tool which should be the move tool this one and then now holding down alt on the keyboard I can just very quickly duplicate these street lights here. And then control delete will deselect the uh, selection. Alright, so I've got some foreground elements and I have backgrounds. Um, you want to make sure that Again, your layers are going to be um, clearly labeled before you go into After Effects. Um, and sometimes I do keep the colors the color block separate from my line art. Um, again, just keep in mind every time things are separated you have the ability to animate them and just to control their properties. Um, so I'll just color this in. Um, by default when I opened up Photoshop um, these blue guidelines were visible. So that is just showing you what's called title safe. Um, back in the days of broadcast production, um, you would create an image. <coughs> back then it was, oh man, can I remember? 640 by 480. <laughs> That's how small we were working back then. This is before HD. Um, and so you would create these images for TV, but you had no control over the audience's TV set. So sometimes people's TVs would like crop the image just because of the border, the frame around their physical TV set. So anyway, that's what title safe means. It just means that if you have any action or titles that are going to happen within these margins, then you know it won't get accidentally cut off or cropped off on someone else's device. Um, it's a little bit less uh, important these days um, because for the most part you know our screens don't have like thick frames bordering them um, but you'll still see them in production software so we can turn these guides off or on uh, just by going to view show and then guides and you can turn those off you can also move them around um, and just move them to something that's helpful for you too um, to move them, you just need the move tool and then you can slide these over. So if you're trying to measure things, um, you can easily use these guides to do that or just turn them off. So view, show, guides, turn off. Right. I was saying before that sometimes I like to keep the color blocks separate from my outlines. And in Photoshop, the easiest way to do that is to actually have a separate layer just for the color block and then a separate layer for the lines. Um, and then you can have some nice effects. Sorry, I'm pressing the wrong thing. Control plus, yes. Um, and then by having the line and the 
Oops. Ah, come on. Control Z. All right. By having the line separate from the color, you could play with these interesting effects in After Effects later on because they were separated. Um, as a note for the future, Harmony has a very built-in, effective way for dealing with line art and color art. Um, but in Photoshop, this is how we have to do it. So I've got my clouds outlined in one color and then colored in, painted in. <laughs> um, I'm also going to hide this timeline panel because we don't need it right now. So I'll come up to window and just deselect that. Okay. So I'll make a final layer for my sky and I can show you the gradient tool if you wanted to do like a sunset or sunrise kind of effect. So let's pick our sky colors. Okay, so I've got a separate layer ready for my sky. Um, the gradient tool is inside the paint bucket tool. So if you click on the paint bucket, click and hold, you'll see where the gradient tool is. And remember, all of these tools have um, corresponding settings and properties at the top that you can further look at and adjust to. So you've got a linear gradient, you've got a, a radial gradient like circles, um, you've got all these different styles of gradients, and then you choose your colors, and then you can set the gradient. So here I've, I've got this radial gradient happening. Um, I can actually extend it so that it's more like this. I can try something that feels... Yeah, we could do that. Kind of like that. All right. So let's just say this is my background art. I'm going to save this as a PSD. And just notice that all of my layers are clearly named. So when I get to After Effects, I'm going to know exactly what's what. Um, I'm going to come back to my rotoscope PSD and also just set that up for After Effects. So I'll show my timeline again. And so. I'm going to rename my video layer. This is going to be my ball animation, or my ball, let's say ball rotoscope. Let's just say that. And then let's say I have, I could even have separate characters too uh, created in Photoshop. And then let's say the dirt is part of the background too. So just so you're aware, in the timeline, you can actually directly export your timeline to a video file. So in that timeline panel menu, you would just click on the menu, come down to render video, and you'll get a familiar set of output options. So this is just so you know this exists. If you were only working in Photoshop, you only needed to export your timeline, you can do it very quickly right from this menu. Um, but for our assignment, I'm not going to have you do that. We're going to save the Photoshop uh, file with all its layers and then import it to After Effects. So I have everything properly named in both of my files. And so now I can quit Photoshop and then open After Effects. I'm going to open a new project. And we're going to organize our project before we get too far. So I'm going to create some folders ahead of time. I'm going to call it elements. This is where we will import our PSD files to. Um, and then I'm going to create a new folder called comps for any um, additional comps that we create while working in After Effects. And then we'll create our main comp here. And again, usually this is named after your shot number or your scene number. So we'll, we'll just call this main roto scene. And then you're going to double check everything will match what we need for class. 1920 by 1080 square pixels. 
Now here's a note, right? So in general, you want your animation software, if you're working between software, you want that frame rate to be consistent. Um, so we animated in 12 frames per second in Photoshop, which means um, you're going to have to keep track of that. At some point, you will have to convert that to 24 for class, right? Um, for now, we're going to keep Photoshop animation and After Effects animation the same frame rate, and we're going to make a mental note to ourselves when we get to Premiere, that's when we're going to convert it to 24. So you just have to be that level of detail oriented. Um, animators really need to be aware of frame rate. So we'll keep this consistent at 12 frames per second right now in After Effects. Here's our main scene. Uh, now let's import our elements. So I'm going to pre-select the elements folders so I keep things organized. The shortcut to import is Control i and then I will import my PSD. Now this is also super important working in After Effects. Um, there's several options to import your files. Uh, when we work with PSD files, Photoshop files, we want to retain that ability to control each layer separately. Um, so we need to import that as a composition. Um, just note here, there's another option to import uh, your, your composition and retain layer sizes. Um, there's pros and cons to both, but for today I'll just show you this one. So we want to import PSDs as compositions into After Effects. If we don't, it's going to flatten all of our layers together and you don't get to animate anything. It's just a one flat still image. Uh, you also get the option to keep the ability to edit your layer effects. So Photoshop and After Effects are super integrated. If you happen to use layer effects in Photoshop, you can retain the ability in After Effects to continue editing them and tweaking them. Um, so this gives you that option here. We can leave this open. Okay. So you'll notice when you import a PSD as a comp, it will come into After Effects in two parts, right? It'll bring you a folder of all of your individual Photoshop layers. So here's all the layers I made. If you double click, it'll open in the footage window. And you can see, all right, here's like the ball happening. And then I had other background elements. I had some dirt here, I had some grass and, and things like that. So all of my Photoshop layers get brought into After Effects and I have access to them separately. And then if you double click this comp icon, right, this is basically what my Photoshop document looked like. So it's really seamless integration. Whatever organization and file layer naming that you had in Photoshop, it will automatically bring it into After Effects. So let's bring in my background artwork too. So I just did control I to import. Make sure you're importing that as a composition. And then import, and we can say okay. And then same deal here. We have access to all of my individual layers. And then we have access to the, the way I had set it up. So very quickly, you can kind of see where this is gonna go. Let's say I bring my background comp into my main comp now. And how would I animate a pan? Well, that's really animating the position keyframe, setting keyframes on the position. So I'm just holding down shift and dragging my background so that uh, it stays horizontal. Um, and then I'm just gonna line it up. Let's say this is a 10 second long shot. And by the end of that shot, we've gotten to the end of our artwork. So if I play that back, that's the basics of animating a panning camera move. Now what was the point of having all those layers, right? Well, this is where it gets really fun and interesting because with all the layers separated, that means we could actually create this multi-plane effect where the foreground elements are moving at a different rate than the background, right? So if you're driving in a car, the, the street lights are like blurry while the mountains and the city in the background is slowly moving around. Um, so what we can do now is actually come into our background comp and shift select all of our layers, control C to copy, and then control V to paste it in our main comp. 
Now we have access to all of these layers within our proper you know, frame size, 1920 by 1080, but we've got these long horizontal layers that we can slide back and forth. Um, so now we can actually animate each level of the background at a different rate. So uh, this circle button is the solo button in After Effects. Um, so that's helpful just to make sure you are, you know, just to confirm you're working with the layer that you want. Um, so I separated my, uh, my line layer that's like yellow grass and then from the yellow color of the grass. So I was talking about how I have my line and color separated. Sometimes I want them separate and sometimes I want to treat them as one entity. So we can use the parenting tool in After Effects to kind of group these layers together. So what I'm going to do is take, uh, make sure your parent and link column is visible. And if it's not, just turn on this toggle switch. Sometimes it gets hidden depending on layout. Um, but you're going to find this spiral option. It's called the pick whip. And you will drag it from one layer to another one. And now these layers are linked. So that means whenever I move this, the color block will follow it. So let me undo that. And now, give me one second. So now I can keyframe uh, just the grass moving. And let's just trim this to about three seconds. And we'll have the foreground elements moving a lot faster than the background. So I've got the, the grass moving, the street lights. I also want it to move with the foreground. So see, now that's moving. Um, I will want, let's see, I've got my, okay, clouds have an outline. Clouds also have a solid color. So I'm just going to parent those for better organization. Um, also, the clouds, I need to move them behind my cityscape because they're behind in the sky. Uh, all right, so here's my cityscape. I'm going to hit P to reveal position, add a keyframe, and then come to the end, and then um, select, hold down shift, and just drag it over a little bit. And so now I have the grass moving at a different speed than the background. And then I can even animate the clouds, too. So I've got my clouds, cloud line, and color block, and those are parented. Um, and so I can add the position keyframe here, and I can have the clouds, actually I can have the clouds going um, the opposite direction. So I'll start it from here, and have as if like the wind is blowing a different direction that day. So then I'll just keyframe it over to here. And now I have this sort of multi-planning movement happening. Now, one reason why I do like to separate color lines from the color block um, is so that I can further adjust and add effects. So first of all, right, it's not super clear from a color theory standpoint that the outlines are different from the, the color block. I just want to heighten that contrast. So since I have them separated, I can quickly add a color effect and just adjust that right here instead of going back to Photoshop. So I'm going to go up to Effect. And then we can do color correction and just a simple hue saturation adjustment. So I can just make this a little bit darker. And now I can, uh, yeah, that's so much clearer visually. So that's just adding a simple effect. Um, I mentioned last week in After Effects, anywhere you see this little stopwatch icon, that means you can animate that property. So when you start getting into effects, you have just like a limitless possibility of things you can animate. Um, what we can do now is just set a keyframe here on our hue saturation. Um, let me come down to the timeline. If I press U on the keyboard, that will only show me the properties that have keyframes on them. And we can actually keyframe a color change um, by coming back here and just changing the hue. So I can go from a dark green color to a dark blue color, and you see how that color slowly animates. So anywhere in After Effects or Premiere that you see a stopwatch, that means you can set a keyframe there, you can animate that property. 
Um, furthermore, I want to take advantage of the fact that these layers are separated, right? Um, so I can actually have my outline moving at a different rate from the color block, and I can even have the street lights moving at a slightly different rate from the foreground. Um, so in that case, I would just unparent all of these layers from each other and just add individual keyframes on each one. Um, so this is the basics of what we call compositing. You know, so I'm taking the background artwork, I'm now bringing it into a scene and starting to animate aspects of the background. Um, now let's incorporate the ball into it. Um, that's a good question. Yes. So nowadays it will update. You want to make sure that you don't change any of the layer names in Photoshop. And you want to make sure you save it in Photoshop first. Um, when you come back to After Effects, if it doesn't automatically update, then you need to just find it in your project window. Um, and then if you right click on it, um, you know, you can try this option, reload footage, or, you know, so on and so forth. Double click a single layer, it opens in the footage window. So let's bring in our animation now and start compositing it with the scene. So I have, you, you can handle this any number of ways. Um, you can grab, depending on how you set up your rotoscope layer, you know, you can grab the whole document. You can turn off the layers you don't want. Um, I'm just going to grab the actual rotoscope video layer that we made in Photoshop. So I'm just going to grab this one here and drag it into my main cup. And I'm going to put it behind my foreground, but in front of my cityscape. Um, I can show you some, how, how we might start approaching shadows. Um, so let's say I've got these clouds and I want them to cast a shadow on the ground. So let's isolate our cloud layers and see what's happening there. So again, here I've separated the line art from the color art, um, which means I could potentially do an effect um, such as change the color of this line. So we can go to effect, color correct, even just doing a simple hue saturation. So let's keyframe that. Press U to reveal any keyframes already on the layer. And then if you, if you drag, uh, across the timeline while holding shift, it lets you snap right to the next keyframe, um, which is helpful so that things are lined up. You can also use the shortcuts J and K to pop to the keyframes. Um, so let's just change this color, color of the clouds. We'll just have them shift like that over the course of the scene. Meanwhile, I can have the color block stay consistent. Um, so that's just the advantage of having things separated. You can just achieve that level of control. Now, so I do want them separated because I wanted to animate the line color changing, but not the color block. But to create a shadow, I want to keep line and color together to cast this shape on the ground. So this is where we're going to pre-comp um, our clouds. So we'll shift select our cloud layers right click and then go to pre-compose and I'm going to call this cloud pre-comp and in this case we're going to want to move all attributes into the new composition so we'll say okay and let's take a minute to look at what happened um, it created a new comp for us this is what we'll organize into our comps folder if we look at the properties here it's a 1920 by 1080 comp Right, so it fits right in our main scene, um, but inside it, you'll see the layers is still our long panning layers, and all the animation keyframes still exist, but they're now nested inside this precomp. So precomps is a good way to kind of like also organize 
levels and layers of animation and, and layers of keyframes. Um, so inside the pre-comp, I have animation happening on the clouds. And then outside the pre-comp, I can apply further effects. So usually, to create shadows, um, we duplicate the comp. And then we color it in. So we're going to go back to color correction. And again, we can just use something as simple as hue saturation. And let's make that dark. And so now I've got a duplicate cloud, right? One cloud comp is entirely silhouetted, because we're going to turn that into a shadow. And then the other cloud comp is the original one with the, the color change animation in it. So here, we can add another effect um, and have it flip, right? Because it's almost like we're creating a reflection of, of this layer image. So you can type in the effects window. You can type in the effects you're looking for and see what comes up. So I'm looking for flip. So I'll just click and drag that to my shadow. And here, if I solo these layers, do you see how it's beginning to create this sort of reflection of the shape? And then it's darkened, and so it's beginning to look like a shadow. Um, so what we can do is, again, further um, keep yourselves organized. Let's just quickly rename this to be Cloud Shadow. Uh, so I just pressed Enter on the keyboard, and it will quickly let you um, rename things. So DS was something I picked up from working uh, in Studio. It stands for Drop Shadow. So now I'm like, OK, I've got one layer that is my cloud drop shadow, and then one that's my regular cloud. So we're going to let's um, further adjust the shape of this cloud. So I can take the anchor tool and move it here. And then I can squash the shape of the cloud so it looks like it's cast onto like a flat ground surface. Um, I'll press S to show you what's happening here. So in, in After Effects, which is a 2D program, we're working with X and Y coordinates, right? X is horizontal, Y is vertical. Um, and so that's how you've got two coordinates here. Uh, when we get to 3D layers, you'll see a third coordinate happen, because you've got that element of depth and Z space now. But right now, we just have X and Y. So I've, in other words, I have just squashed the Y um, aspect of this layer. I can also stretch it too, but I just wanted to control the Y so you can unlink it and do it manually, um, or you can use this arrow tool and do it manually here in your frame. And then I'll hit P and make sure there's no keyframes here that I might potentially mess up. And then I'm just going to position the whole squashed thing down to the ground, and I'll turn everything back on so you can see. So. I'm going to have to reposition layers so that it's on top. Yeah. Um, and then I can also use the arrow keys to position it down. Um, and so then we can come in here to toggle uh, the modes. And Photoshop has this too, but you can adjust sort of the blending mode of it. So we can do multiply and then lower the opacity just a tiny. Oh, wait, wrong layer. I want my cloud shadow opacity here, right? So now I can create this sort of shadow effect. Um, I can further add a blur effect on top of here. So let's type in blur. And let's see what we've got. Fast blur, Gaussian blur, any of these choices you can experiment with. So here's blur. Let's see what the controls are. So here's all the different um, effects that we have on this cloud layer. So we can blur this like this. And then now I can zoom out. The shortcuts for zooming out of the comp window in After Effects is period and comma, those two little carrot characters. So in and out, that's also really quick. Quick shortcut. So now I have this, you know, dimensionality to my scene while the ball is bouncing. Um, and that's basically what a compositor 
does. You know, they take all of these different elements, um, they're putting it together into one scene, they're adding effects, they're like color correcting, and again, the idea is to make it feel like it's part of the same world. Um, so even if you are playing with a style that's like collage based or a lot of different textures, um, there's still this compositing moment where you're finessing all those pieces and making them feel like they've, they fit together. What's required for the assignment are these three components. Um, a rotoscoping component that you'll do in Photoshop with the timeline. Um, a separate background art component that you'll create separately. You'll have layers in there. And then some After Effects compositing component we're going to put everything together and then you'll add additional keyframe animation. Um, I suggest that you try a camera move with your keyframe animation, but again, it's meant to be open-ended. If you've already used After Effects before and you want to play with keyframes in another way, like that's, that's part of the assignment. You can do that too. Yes. Okay, I think the difference is when you grab all of your layers from the project window, it is organized alphabetically. Okay. But what I did was actually I opened the comp and then I copied and pasted it from my comp. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you could change the speed, you could change the frame rate of that animation. Uh, I can show you where that is just so you know it's an option. Um, so this is my animation layer and you see I brought it in at 12. 12 frames per second. If you right click on any of these layers in your project window, you get additional controls. Um, and so you can go to interpret footage and uh, go to the main menu and you can actually tell it to reinterpret this footage at a different frame rate. Just make sure that your animation layer is going to be the same frame rate as your comp frame rate. And your comp frame rate is here. So to render this out, I'll just quickly show you, and then we can switch gears. So go to the composition window, make sure you're in your main scene. Oh yeah, let's turn on everything. And just be cognizant of the beginning and ending point of your work area. So that's what this bracket is. So always just be cognizant of trimming it to the end of your animation. Um, what we don't need is like all these blank frames where nothing's happening. That's just a lot of extra computer power. Uh, when we're screening it in class, you know, we're gonna sit for eight seconds while nothing's happening. You know, so just like those are the kinds of like detail-oriented, you know, tasks to be aware of. Whenever you export anything, just always check your work area. So the shortcuts is B for beginning, N for end. Um, so set your work area before you go to render it. Uh, also save your project. <laughs> um, composition menu, and then we're going to add to render queue, um, or you can send it to Adobe Media Encoder, which I mentioned last week is a separate Adobe program that lets you render things in the background while you continue to use the software. Uh, for now, I'll just show you how to render it straight out from After Effects. Um, so you'll get this view and you will want to check render settings and output module. So render settings, double check that it's 1920 by 1080. Um, and then here we go, time span. So just render the work area. So if you had set your B and N points, um, then you're all ready to go. Um, I, always, I always double check the frame rate too. So since we're going to premiere after this, um, it's okay that this is at 12 frames per second because I'm going to do one additional step in Premiere. Um, so we'll say okay. And then output module is where we'll make sure that our format is what we need for class. So QuickTime, uh, come into format options and then you'll set that to Apple ProRes 422HQ. Um, side note here, you could actually render it at animation compression, which is um, a slightly higher quality than Apple ProRes. Uh, the reason being that we're still going to take this to Premiere before we hand it in. So you still have one more step to go uh, before you need to match all the settings for class. So if that makes sense to you, then, then note that that is possible. 
If not, then just make sure it's Apple ProRes. Um, if you've got audio in here, make sure it's turned on, but again, we'll be adding audio in Premiere. So that's set to go. And then now output to, this is where you just want to stay organized with your shot. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not showing me the other option. Okay. Sometimes I like to make a folder just for renders. Um, that way I know what to import into Premiere later on. Um, generally, when you're working also in a studio, sometimes you're going to be making several versions of the same scene, depending on the notes you get from the director, the producer, um, other animators. So usually it's marked with the date. Uh, 22. Sometimes you even mark it with the time. Um, what time is it? Two something. You know, so two in the afternoon at 2:23. You know, sometimes the turnaround in the studio can be very quick. Uh, you're under crunch time. The director is hovering over you, making multiple changes. So this is where you would just be super organized about what version. Um, Sometimes in a studio too, when you have a team of animators, everyone's animating a different shot. You put your initials at the end so they know if there's a problem, who to ask to fix things. Um, so again, usually the studio will be very specific about how to name your files. Um, again, just helpful information for you to know. What I'm looking for is just ultimately what you hand in. What is that file name and what is that compression? So that's all set up and then we just hit render. And then it was such a short scene that it already finished, but you can also press down caps lock um, and that will render it just a little bit faster. Uh, what it does is that it will show you a preview of every frame and when you have a lot of effects on there, you don't need to watch the preview while it's rendering. Just like render it as soon as you can. So hit caps lock to disable that preview. It'll go a little bit faster. All right. So from this point, you would then just import your, um, your rendered scene and bring it into Premiere Pro, where you're going to add a title card and you'll add at least three sound effects. Um, and then you'll export it from Premiere and hand it in. So there's a Photoshop phase, there's a After Effects phase, and there's a Premiere phase. Um, again, this is just sort of like giving you practice of an entire production workflow on a very small scale. You know, one week to just kind of put this together. Um, it's really just understanding all those technical moving pieces. Eventually, in the second half of the semester, you know, we'll be scaling this to an actual film, you know, uh, but at least you'll start to get a taste of all the different components this week.